thank you thank kalyan thank you so much thank you sir welcome all and now i would like to request our chief guest dr prakash trivedi sir along with all the dignitaries to come for a virtual lamp lighting ceremony and formal inauguration of today's webinar pankurutham kalyanam arogyam jana sampada shubham purutvam kalyanam arogyam jana sampada shatru buddhi vinashaya jeevachu jinamusute jeevachu jinamusute shubham purutvam kalyanam arogyam jana sampada shubham purutvam kalyanam arogyam thank you all this ritual of lamp lighting is a symbolic moment and it signifies the dispelling of darkness and ignition of thoughts and enlightenment and now it's my proud privilege to introduce the force behind this series of webinar benchmark dr sneha bhuyar madam who is really working hard for this uh, academic dissemination of uh, knowledge madam has all the awards in her credit which includes international ms signature awards for leadership asia gcc award 2021 dr dhurusha award for national individual individual award champion for foxy award lokmat healthcare excellence award ma'am had so many chapters and articles in her credit with more than 300 talks keynotes and orations thank ma you ma'am in the past ma'am was the foxy breast committee chairperson and national adolescent trainer for who certified fpai national expert of unicef and pa reviewer of jogi yeah. thank you so much dr mukta thank you for that uh, generous introduction a very good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to one and all at the outset let me thank respected sir uh, dr prakash trivedi the past president of iig and my mentor of course Uh, and Dr. Atul Ganatra, the newly installed president of IG, uh, for being the chief guest, and Dr. Krishna Kumar and uh, Dr. Pandit Paraskar, the immediate past president of IG, for being the guest of honor for today's program. Uh, I welcome the esteemed speakers and stalwarts in the field of gynae endoscopy, Dr. Deepak Limbajia, the join in the field. Not only our pride, but India's pride, I would say, Dr. Shailesh Puntambekar. Uh, though i have a special privilege, privilege to have him as my immediate senior and uh, the alumna of bich medical college pune and also uh, having him as you know one of the best operating uh, faculty or one of the best operating workshop of my tenure as president of yavatma society way back in 2007 dr smit patel uh and of course the one more bich alumni uh, dr melin telang uh, thank you all of you for accepting the invitation and gracing the program i also welcome the uh, chairpersons dr sanjay makwana madam anita singh uh, madam rekha kurian and dr arun barua dr mangala dogra of course warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for uh, joining uh I welcome my dear friend, Doctor, a very vibrant, heavy-weighted personality. I would say, Doctor Kalyan Baramde, the convener for today's program, and Doctor Mukta Agrawal and Doctor Ekika Singh for putting together an amazing program and wonderful coordination with the faculties. Let me confess that I do only basic uh, gynae laparoscopy, gynae endoscopy work, and I do uh, outsource to laparoscopic surgeon. but definitely and that's a very reason i'm not very active in ig um this program um is very well scheduled and i take this opportunity to humbly seek all of your blessings and wholehearted support for my candidature as foxy vice president once again i thank all of you for accepting the invitation and joining uh, thank you so much welcome uh, krishna kumar sir and i take this uh, opportunity to introduce my mentor dr prakash trivedi sir um, who is uh, actually uh, doesn't ne need any introduction sir no sir is a past president of foxy past president of iig and so many you know um, awards and accolades uh, achievements to sir's credit 
I, I, I don't think we really need all this. And I just uh, hand over to you, sir, for your precious words. Over to you, Dr. Prakash Divedi, sir. Uh, pleasure, pleasure today evening. Oh. And uh, uh, the word benchmark itself is uh, very important because nowadays in every nooks and corner, Everybody finds a rectal endometriosis in the middle of the night. And uh, so benchmark becomes very important. And uh, the speakers selected are uh, uh, very good. Obviously, the chairpersons and other uh, important people in endoscopy, in IAG, and overall in education. Uh, so Mukta, if you are active in education, uh, it is more than enough. You need not uh, do more endoscopy. Uh, many of these uh, activities becomes easy because you know you get experts' view, and you can quietly uh, uh, admire. And every time Kumar is here, Kalyan is here, even when we go to a cadaveric course as a tutor or even as an expert, every time we are also learning. So it's always better to be part of the right. academic program. Uh, Anita Singh, madam, good evening. You are searching or looking? I don't know. Uh, and uh, Kumar, how are you? All fine, thank you. So it's a great honor and privilege. And uh, Atul, uh, incidentally, he is the endoscopist who is more busy in obstetrics. And uh, so that is why, you know, uh, sometimes you find it is difficult to catch him. I think so we move with the program. I will be hearing most of the speakers because it's an education for me. And uh, smartly, you people have lined up very good speakers. Uh, one, the two doins, Sailesh Pundambekar and uh, Deepak Limbashya. I think so. Probably Sailesh is the best teacher as a surgeon. And he is the best surgeon who can really teach uh, almost from head to the base, various surgery. And he has vast knowledge and tremendous interest in education, apart from doing good surgery. And the same is with uh, Deepak Lingbashya. Uh, both are very good uh, surgeons. To be very honest and clear, I have learned from both. Uh, way back in 2012, I started doing direct uterine at the origin after picking up from Sailesh. And then, apart from learning so many things from Sailesh, then suddenly I realized that Deepak was standing on the same side where I am standing. So then again, it became a little, little different uh, ball game. So endoscopy is always uh, learning and spreading safe surgery. So it's my pleasure to be on this program. And Sneha, we wish you a great program, a great future. And definitely you should be the vice president of Foxy. Thank you. Sneha, can I, can I talk one minute? Uh, hello, Dr. Prakash. I was looking at you. I was not searching anyone. And hello, all the doyans of endoscopic surgery, not only from India, you can say from the world. So I don't know how they have been able to pick up all of them at one platform at one time. It must have been very difficult congratulating you that you have been able to do it. Thank you very much for calling me here on this. Thank, thank you so much, madam. In fact, I have officially welcomed all of you and welcome Dr. Shailesh. Uh, uh, I did talk about you. It's not our pride only, but India's pride. We do have Dr. Shailesh Puntamekar and a uh, pleasure uh, having you as the speaker today. So welcome once again. Uh, Saiti, can we have Dr. Atul Ganatar's uh, CV? Uh, I think uh, sir has not joined, but I just uh, welcome uh, and introduce in short uh, that uh, sir is the newly installed president of IAG and once he joins, we can have his words. Uh, can we have Dr. Uh, Krishna Kumar CV? Yes. Mm -hmm. So very good evening, uh, sir, and a warm welcome to you as well. Uh, as we all know that sir is the past president of IAG and the chief consultant of JK Women Hospital, 40th Hospital, Kalyan. And uh, of course, um, he's the 
course coordinator and uh, you know recipient of so many awards uh, definitely we would like to have your precious words and uh, over to you sir dr thank Krishnan. you thank you it's a big pleasure and honor to be here in this uh, webinar and as dr trivedi said uh, all the leaders or the masters have been included in this program and dr anita singh was wondering how it could be but you must remember that each one of them is very much interested in teaching and that is why they are here so the moment you approach any of these trivedi mm -hmm. pantambekar deepak limbachya they are there in the moment you have to just invite them and they will be there so that is the secret that all of them are there and it i have been associated with dr trivedi since more than 3 decades and of course as you said he is one of the biggest motivator for all of us and then joy continue to learn and as dr trivedi himself said learning is a process which one has to continue and uh, with learning if you teach you learn more so that is why any webinar which we feel it is interesting we are joining and we learn something different and of course we have with us dr puntam bekar and deepak limbachya both from apart from being a great teacher as dr trivedi said one is a big pusher in every he will attract everybody into learning and that is why he pushes everybody into learning and deepak limbachya very quiet person he attracts by his own charm and people are pulled towards him for learning and i'm sure this webinar will be a great uh, learning experience for all and and we have the just immediate past president dr palaskar also joining in so you have really collected a real galaxy of uh, stars of endoscopic surgeon dr bayan and i with this few words i would definitely wish you the best and not only for this webinar but also for all the future webinars and for your election in the as the poxy vice president which i'm sure you will this time thank you thank you so much sir thank you for your blessings and best wishes and uh, welcome uh, dr pandit paraskar the immediate past president of iig and sir we have witnessed your very vibrant very successful tenure um, what a tenure you had you know all over india uh, huge operative workshops and of course so much of learning from your side so it will be a great pleasure listening to you sir over to you dr pandit paraskar for your precious words hi good evening everybody good evening trivedi sir good evening sir good evening yeah good evening after uh, meeting in kashi <laughs> i think this is the second time everybody is there on this uh, vibrant platform trivedi sir and shailesh sir we miss you in the kashi conference varanasi conference i was there you left <laughs> <laughs> shailesh was there on sunday yes we were there sir the house call yeah So, Shailesh doesn't so. miss. He traveled from Bangalore only yeah. for giving a lecture. That is his passion for teaching, not only yeah. everybody but the gynecologists who are his, I think, closest more than the surgeon. Sometimes I feel. Yeah. So thank you so much and uh, congratulations, Neha Madam, for the wonderful organization of this uh, endoscopy symposium. uh friends since uh, last uh, decade the endoscopy in india has risen to a greater heights under the leadership of all these uh, past president dr trivedi sir dr uh, krishna kumar dr sunita madam dr baskar pal and uh, i'm sure in coming year also dr atul ganatra and the team they will take the endoscopy at uh, greater levels Uh, this is a very wonderful webinar i am uh, uh, many of the gynecologists endoscopic surgeons uh, they have already joined and uh, these uh, doyans of endoscopy dr shailesh dr deepak limbachya uh, dr milin telang and smith patel they are going to teach us the uh, dr shailesh is going to uh, teach us how laparoscopy has crossed all the barriers in the oncology Uh, Dr. Deepak Limbachya will be showing his uh, treasures of the difficult cases he has uh, treated, and of course, uh, Dr. Milin Telang will be showing us the world of the hysteroscopy, and Dr. Smith Patel will be showing us how to manage the deep endometriosis uh, center of excellence from uh, Ahmedabad. So, uh, I am uh, very thankful to Dr. Sneha for inviting me, and uh, let's enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, sir.
Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. Sir. So congratulate uh, Pandit Kalyan and everybody. Thank you so much. And, uh, as oh, usual, like as, as, as Kumar was telling, you know there are such gel gelled teachers in endoscopy that nobody can be separated. Please go ahead with your program. Thank you so much, sir. Once again for accepting the invitation and gracing the program. Thank you so much for your precious words. Uh, uh, respected Dr. Prakash Tivedi, sir, Dr. Atul Garanta is busy, but uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna Kumar, sir, and Dr. Pandit Paraskar. I uh, thank all of you, all the esteemed speakers and uh, chairpersons for today's program. Of course, uh, Dr. Karlan Baramdev, who is the convener for today's program, and Dr. Mukta, who has coordinated so well. I thank all of you. I'm very happy that you like this word, the benchmark, because uh, you must be uh, watching that, uh, you know, it's not uh, only the doing the programs, but, you know, having this proper topics and, you know, the app speakers who are the authorities in their field. That is what the aim of this uh, program. That is what we are doing. And uh, thank you so much for, you know, supporting this view. Thank you so much once again. And for academic uh, proceedings, I hand over the forum to Dr. Mukta Agrawal. Over to you, you, Dr. Mukta. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, distinguished Thank you. guests, for your words of blessings and wisdom. And moving on, it's my proud privilege and distinct honor to introduce with the chairpersons of the first session. And my first chairperson is Dr. Sanjay Makwana. Sir is the Chief Medical Director and ART Specialist of, at Vasundhara Hospital Limited, Jodhpur. And uh, Sir is a renowned person in the field of endoscopy. Sir uh, was the past president is our Rajasthan chapter, president Indian Medical Association Jodhpur and is current chairperson of IAGE Rajasthan chapter. Sir is trained in, uh, he has trained more than 275 gynecologists in ART and endoscopy and it's our proud privilege that sir is here with us. He will be joining us in a, in a short while and uh, uh, my second chairperson yeah, is... I have been introduced, Mr. Mr. You can go ahead. Thank yeah. you. And it's an honor to introduce Dr. Anita Singh Majam, the Iron Lady. Ma'am is ex-professor Patna Medical College, Vice President Foxy 2020, past president of POGS. Ma'am is currently the president Bihar Chapter IAGE and the Organizing Secretary of AICOG 2014 at Patna. Ma'am is teacher of teachers and she really needs no introduction. So I hand over the session to the revered chairpersons to carry on the first session. I request Anita ma'am to please introduce our first speaker, Dr. Salesh Putamrekar, sir. Ma'am, you are muted. Thank you, Dr. Mukta. Uh, first of all, I want to inform you that Dr. Shalesh and Dr. Limbachia both have visited Patna in last one year. And I have seen both of them closely operating for the whole day. And that was really mesmerizing. Today, I have got the opportunity to chair their session. And the topics have been so well chosen. Dr. Shalesh is going to tell us about the role of laparoscopy in gynae endoscopy. Gynae oncology, actually, because he does most of the time oncology, but else he also does uterine transplant and all the things. So we'll hear from him how much endoscopy has gone into management of gynecological malignancy. And the next talk is equally important for each laparoscopic surgeon, and that is expect the unexpected, which happens many times. Intraoperative management and these thunderbolt discoveries. So I think both the topics are so interesting. First of all, we'll be listening to Dr. Shailesh Pendum Baker, and um, he's a laparoscopic cancer surgeon and robotic cancer surgeon. He's medical director at Galaxy Care Multi-Speciality Hospital, Pune. 
He has patented many things out of his the technique of radical hysterectomy, Pune technique is one of them. Conducted India's first successful laparoscopic assisted uterine transplant. A baby girl was delivered in October 2018 at their hospital only out of transplant. Only Indian to be the board member of AAGL, that is American Association of Gynae Laparoscopists, and a faculty, faculty and member of AAGL, AAGL Oncology Committee also. His operating faculty at IRCAD and various other international organizations and their conferences, largest series of transthoracic esphagectomy, endoscopic and robotic. So he's not only into gynecology, he has gone in the field of chest also. He is known for performing the most difficult laparoscopic endoscopic surgeries, thyroid, renal, upper GI, colorectal. Uh, I think he is a blessed person. No normal person can do all these things at a time. So he, he is especially blessed from the God. He is pioneer of laparoscopic anterior and posterior exenteration for colorectal and uterine malignancies. So with all these in his feather, in his hat, he is going to be amongst us. We are so lucky to have him with us, have him from our own country. And we are lucky today to listen to him about it, what he has to say about gynae oncology surgery by endoscopy. So Dr. Shellis, please start your turn. Uh, yeah. So good evening, everybody. At the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Sneha, who is also from my college from where I did my uh, master's of surgery. Uh, Sneha has been my junior in BJ Medical College and I have been to a place to operate. And thank you for giving me this opportunity and I give all the best to you and I hope that you become the vice president and later on president of Foxy. All our blessings, all our support and thank, thank you, you IAG always uh, at the forefront to teach and conduct this seminar. And so thank you all of you. I can see Dr. Trivedi also, one of my closest friends and always a guide. So I will start the presentation. So whenever we start this presentation, I always say that it's all about anatomy, anatomy and nothing else but anatomy. Because it's a better guide for any dissection. Whether you do laparoscopy, robotic, minimal access, it doesn't matter. It's all about understanding the lapros uh, the, the entire area. So the role of laparoscopy has been changing in oncology. And if we consider all these areas, we'll go through this today completely. What are the new things which have happened in endometrial cancer? Endometrial cancer is the cancer which is being tackled by almost all the gynecologists. And 90% of them are in the early stage. What is the role of uh, laparoscopy in CA endometrium? The NCCN guidelines very, very clearly say that surgery is the mainstay. But what has changed over the period of years is rather than doing only surgery, we are now going to sentinel lymph node biopsy. The sentinel lymph node is normally done for patients who are having low-grade cancers, less than 50% of invasion. And then... Once you do the sentinel node, if there is an ultra staging, which is done with the IHC, if that ultra staging is positive, the patient goes for adjuvant treatment. Just to give you an example, in 2000, the entire survival of cancer of the endometrium in the first stage, less than 50%, was only 75%. Today, with sentinel node and adjuvant treatment, the survival has gone to 95%. So understand, this is one of the most success stories in endometrial cancers. So sentinel node was first uh, done by a very close friend of mine, Nadim Rustum. He is from Sloan Kettering Memorial. He used the blue dye to identify the nodes in the early stages and avoiding a complete nodal dissection and avoiding the morbidity. So then the lab 2 trial came, which very conclusively proved in 2009, if you go through this trial, that the first choice of surgery in endometrial cancer should be laparoscopy and nothing but laparoscopy because laparoscopy and laparotomy have the same oncological results. So no longer are we talking about whether we should do laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is the mainstay. The only contraindication is surgeon not trained for laparoscopy. What is sentinel node? Sentinel lymph node is the first node receiving the lymphatic drainage. The pathological status of this node reflects the overall status of the entire lymphatic basin. 
So sentinel node is the current modern approach for surgical staging. It is mainly to be done in patients with early stage cancer. That is 90% of them that we see in our practice. We hardly see patients more than 50% invasion. With low risk endometrial cancers, ultra staging remains the most important thing because there is a 50% increase in upstaging of the tumor. What we thought as stage one goes to stage two and therefore they receive adjuvant treatment leading to better survival. So the most cost-effective strategy, it should be done for all FIGO stage 1A2 to 1B1 and for all radical hysterectomies with sentinel node mapping. So this is how the sentinel node would look. It is a dye, which is an uh, ICG, endocyanin green dye, which is injected at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. And then when you want to see this, you open this space completely. So once you have injected this 20 minutes before starting the surgery, after 20 to 25 minutes, you open the retroperitoneum. And once you open the retroperitoneum, you keep on seeing the nodes. And then you ask the, the guy to put the sentinel, that is the infrared light, which is used. And slowly you will start seeing the lymphatics. The lymphatics will guide you to the node. So you slowly go there and you will see the node over there. Now, this is the first station for the entire metastasis. So you pick up the node, you pick up this node and dissect this entire node. And once you can see that was a node which was lurking behind the external iliac artery and the vein. And once this node is seen, again, see whether you have picked up the correct node. You see the sentinel node, take out the node and then do not send for frozen section. But what you should be doing is to send it for ultra staging. And what do you mean by ultra staging is an immunohistochemistry which has to be done. This is how you should do it. This is another example. You can see that we always hitch the entire uterus. Once the uterus is hitched, you can start on the lateral side. Always start on the lateral side. You can see this is an only mode. You can see how beautifully you can understand the lymphatics of this area. And then these nodes can be picked up. Very, very simple technique. You can do this. Then this is an onlay mode which we see and this onlay mode you inject the ICG about 15 to 20 minutes before start of the surgery just about one centimeter deep and giving only one millimeter of the, uh, uh, the dye and once this is done then you start the dissection and as you start the dissection you can see the node coming up into the picture. This is called as the onlay mode. This is seen with the Rubina camera. You don't have to switch to the black light and you can very very clearly see how nicely the node can be picked up. It can be either blue or it can be completely uh, uh, green, whichever color you want to choose pick up this node and send it for the entire area. And this is how you see this is the ICG with the blue. And again, on the other side, you see there is a node which is seen, but you don't know whether the node is completely involving that. Wait for some minutes and you will see the node turning into blue. Slowly and steadily, the node will become blue. And then this is the node that you have to pick up. And this node should be now sent for immunohistochemistry. A fairly simple technique. All of you should use this technique for early endometrial cancers. And this will help you to identify the subset of patients who are likely to recur in the next few days. So ultra staging is very, very important. This is the latest thing that has happened in this area. And you have to understand. And every patient should undergo a, uh, the, the ICG guided area. So this was a study that we did. What is the role of paraiotic dissection? This is something which is very, very important to understand in endometrial cancer. There is a very limited role for paraiotic dissection. The patients with intermediate or high risk of recurrence, patients with poorly differentiated cancer, P53 positive, and of course, myometrial invasion of more than 50%. Indications for cervical cancers are different than for endometrial cancers. So, paraiotic node dissection is very, very limited. It is only for 10% of the patients that we see in practice. These are the indications of paraiotic node in ovarian cancer. I will talk about it later. And what does paraiotic dissection help you in better survival? Of course, in indicated patients, you can see this is the SEMPAL study, which has very clearly shown paraiotic lymphadenectomy is very, very important in indicated endometrial cancers. That is the indication that I told you more than 50% in invasion. P53 positive, poorly differentiated cancers. These are the areas and of course, the, uh, the people with very endometroid cancer. 
So this is the laparoscopic technique. You can either use the extraperitoneal technique or you can use the, the extraperitoneal technique. The important message is laparoscopy is a safe thing to use uh, the transperitoneal or extraperitoneal approach. So you can see this is the transperitoneal approach. You can easily do a transperitoneal approach. This is the line of mesentery that you have to cut. Keep the bowel in the right iliac fossa and the lumbar region. Cut the line of mesentery. And once you cut the line of mesentery, you can enter the paraiotic region. You can see that that is the paraiotic region. It is one of the best ways to do. It is just an easy dissection. You see the ureter on this side, the gonadals on this side. The vessels do not have branches on the anterior side. So you can now dissect the entire node from this area. So this is the transperitoneal dissection. You can see the large nodes which are sitting. You can see that there is no tributary on the anterior anterior wall of the inferior vena cava, you can take out the node just by doing a sweeping movements because that's what I've been my teaching is remain parallel and parallel. You can see the entire inferior vena cava completely clear. Big nodes, these were the nodes which were done after post chemotherapy and you can see the nodal recurrences which were there. We could easily clear that. So this is one approach by which and these are the post ganglionic fibers from this area. These are the paraiotic regions and you can clear it completely. So this is how you should do this but it should be done in extra uh, uh, should be done in only indicated patients. What about cervical cancer? Cervical cancer, we have a lot of things. If you see the NCCN guidelines, you can do it for 1A1 and 1A2 and 1B1. Even today, you can do them laparoscopically. So what is the procedure which we do for the first, uh, when you have a very, very early cancer and patients want to preserve the fertility, what we do is trachelectomy. And this we have done a multiples of them. So this is a trachelectomy which is done just for fertility preservation. You can do this. This is the area how you can do. You can watch this. And then you take a incision, take out the entire cervical canal. This is what you close. You take out the entire cervical canal. You can see that. And then of course, put a Foley catheter and rejoin the uterus back to the vagina. So this is done for 1A1, 1A2 because you cannot radiate the patient and this is not, just not correct. So trachelectomy should be done and is to be done for patients who require fertility preservation. This is very important. We first preserve, we first publish this way back. And this is a publication which came long time back about laparoscopic nerve sparing trachelectomy. Non-fertility sparing surgeries, the, all the surgeries in the cervical cancers were stopped in 2018 following a very big trial that is the LAC trial which showed that there is more amount of recurrences and more deaths when you do it laparoscopically rather than what you do it with open surgery. Lot of questions were being raised, but in 2018 New England Journal of Medicine in October, after that, everything was stopped. Bold stopped doing laparoscopy for oncology. There were multiple people who questioned this because nobody operated on 1B2 trial. The patients, they operated on 1B2, that is tumors more than 2 centimeters. They used the manipulators. They did a colpotomy without the containment, a lot of other things. And therefore, the spread of the cervical cancer was not understood. They landed up with a lot of recurrences in the areas of vagina and the pararectal area because they didn't understand the parametrium. And the anterior parametrium, that is, we know the lateral parametrium, which is McEnroe's, we know the posterior parametrium, which is the uterosacral. What we do not know is the anterior parametrium and the failure to clear the anterior parametrium was leading to more and more recurrences in the pelvis. So this is the key step that is called as infraureteral parametrium. When you do the open surgery with the finger, you can just push the entire thing and you will go to the anterior parametrium. In laparoscopic surgery, you have to make efforts. So you have to push the ureter, push the nerve and go to the anterior side. So you go more and more on the anterior side. This is what is the anterior parametrium. And because they did not clear the anterior parametrium, this is the infraureteral parametrium. That is the reason they got the recurrences. And this is again a film to show this is the area you can see this is the anterior or ureteric tunnel. Once you take the ureteric tunnel, lateralization of the ureter is very, very critical. 
So you slowly and steadily, you see, you lateralize the entire ureter. Still, you see the parametrium, which is underneath the ureter. It is called as the infraureteral parametrium. This parametrium has to be seen. And once you see the parametrium, then this parametrium, you can see it is characterized by the presence of inferior vesicle vein. You see all the three parametrium. You can see the posterior one, the lateral one, and the anterior. And two centimeters of the parametrium has to be taken. This is what they didn't realize. And therefore, they had a lot of recurrences. We published this and we got the fifth Golden Telescopic Award for this understanding the anterior parametrectomy. Preventing local and pelvic recurrences in cervical cancer. This we got in 2020. We again published this in 2021. We were the first to talk against the LAC trial. And this is the anatomical description of the anterior parametrium that we published. And therefore, now with this PUNA technique that we got, this is the new NCCN guidelines. Now, this is various techniques that we use. We use the uterine hitch technique. We did not use the manipulator. The most important thing, this is how we hitch the uterus. So we did not have any recurrences. You can see it's a very, very easy technique. You just hitch up the uterus. Don't use the manipulator and you will be able to do the surgery very, very well. Of course, you can do a nerve sparing surgery. This is not the topic for that. And we will not take this. But laparoscopic lymphadenectomy is a part of this procedure. And it should be easily done. This is by remaining parallel to the various or uh, the external iliac artery and the external iliac vein. A fairly simple procedure now being done by a lot of endoscopists in India. But this is a fairly simple procedure to be done. And this is how your parametrium should look on the, both the sides. While opening the colpotomy, you should never do the colpotomy directly. Use a purse string suture so that the tumors do not, tumor cells do not land up into the vagina. You can use a complete, see this is a purse string suture that we have taken. And after taking the purse string suture, that is like a laparoscopic shout us procedure which should be done. And unless you do that, this is not the way you can do. So containment of the colpus is very important. The second important thing is you can do this by doing uh, by doing uh, using the staplers. So this is another thing which you can do. Instead of, if you are not conversant with this, you can use a stapler. This is a stapler which is used. This stapler can be used to prevent any spillage of the tumor cells in the vagina. And once you use the staplers, the cells will not spill in the vagina. You cut the vagina below the stapler line so that later on the patient does not complain. So laparoscopic and robotic surgery was being used and this is various ways in which, and of course, you had the shouters modification. You can also do this transvaginally. You can do a suture below the vagina. And once you take the suture, you can see, take a vaginal cuff from below. Once the cuff is taken, this is the cuff which is taken vaginally. You can go then laparoscopically and you will see that you have already closed the vaginal cuff. So these modifications helped us not to get any pelvic recurrences and this is complete parametrectomy which is done. So what next? Can we use laparoscopy in advanced stages? Of course, we can use it in excentration. So you can see we can do laparoscopic excentration, anterior excentration, posterior excentration and total pelvic excentration. So there is a role of laparoscopy in advanced tumors of the pelvis. This is the anterior excentration. You can see this is a complete removal and then we are implanting the ureter into this area. And then you can also do a total pelvic excentration, which is also easy to do and this can be completely done so this is how you can do a total pelvic excentration so there is a role of laparoscopy at every stage in oncology you can see for cervical cancers in advanced stages also we can do this so this is very very important we published our excentration way back and this was a this is the latest article on total pelvic excentration for gynecological malignancies and we have around five of our references are there because we have the largest series of excentration in important. So MIS can be done in tumors less than two centimeters. Surgical techniques cannot be compared. Understand the role of anterior parametrium and then it is very, very important. The next thing is ovarian cancer. As soon as I utter the word ovarian cancer, a lot of people say, what are you going to do in ovarian cancers? We know epithelial cancers are the simplest cancers and they are form the bulk of the cancer. But there are certain cancers, the epithelial cancers, there is a definite role. I will tell you when it has to be used. 
but you can do this as a prophylactic oophorectomy. This is commonly done nowadays with patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2. It is the simplest thing to be done. And thanks to Angelina Jolie, a lot of people are now doing BRCA1 and BRCA2. Then, of course, you have to put for borderline tumors. For these tumors, one simple message after this seminar I would like to give you. Any adnex cell tumor that you see, the most important thing, you do not know whether it is cancer or no. It looks non-cancerous, but still always see to it that you don't have rupture of the tumor. It is very, very important not to have the rupture of the tumor. And the third thing is always and always put it in an endo bag. You will always get surprises. Rupture of the tumor in univariate analysis is one of the worst prognostic factors. So put it in an endo bag and do it. Now, this is another thing. If you have a very, very big large cyst, what you can do is you can inject the trocar directly. And once you uh, de completely decompress that, put a suture on that. And once you have sutured this, then you can put it in the endo bag. See to it that there is no spillage, absolutely no spillage. And then you can take it out. This is another thing which you can do. For early ovarian tumors like granulosa cell and theca cell tumors, stromal cell tumors, there is a role of laparoscopy. Very, very simple. You can see that you can immediately take it out, put it in the bag, and that is how you can do this and take it out. So why in early stage? Only in early stage, only when the tumor is in stage one, you can use it in laparoscopy. But in patients in whom you have given new adjuvant chemotherapy and they have responded extremely well to chemotherapy, you can still do a complete laparoscopic hysterectomy. So this is a cytoreductive surgery. This was a patient who was stage 3C, received four cycles of chemotherapy. And following that, see, we are doing a total, this is the kind of tumor, the ascites was gone, and we could do a complete BSO, complete hysterectomy. And this tumor, we could immediately take out laparoscopically, thereby allowing us to give chemotherapy. This is all, and then take out the nodes. And additional to the nodes, you have to take out the appendix, you can see this is the appendix that we are taking out. And this is how you can do it for new adjuvant post, new adjuvant tre treatment. And of course, you need to add omentectomy, which is a very, very simple thing to do. So you can see this is the omentectomy, which you can take out. And diaphragmatic stripping. This is the diaphragmatic stripping that we have done in patients where there are small tumors remaining after new adjuvant treatment. Very simple when you do it laparoscopically and very, very simple because you can go in all the quadrants using the laparoscope. Appendicectomy, of course, remains the most important thing. Then there is a role of laparoscopy as a second look laparoscopy. I will show you a multiple patients, patients who have received 18 cycles, 20 cycles of chemotherapy and rising CY, CA125. We, and you are not able to find anything on PET scan. We do a diagnostic scopy the same way that was written in Corpulsen and Devita that you should do a second look laparotomy, but no longer. In this patient, only the CA125 was increasing. And what did we see? There was a cystic mass behind the sigmoid colon. The patient had about 200 sigma, uh, CA125 five years after the surgery. And CA125 rising, nothing was shown on PET scan because there is a 30% false positive rate in cystic lesions when you see this. And therefore, you can see this is how we could take out the tumor. Similar, another example, this is a patient in whom we saw this, a large tumor after giving 18 or 20 cycles of chemotherapy, just a cystic mass rising CA125, and we could take it out and put it in an endo bag and take it out. So these are various areas. This was a, this lady was a pathologist who came all the way from Chandigarh. She had undergone an open surgery for uh, ovarian cancer and she continued to have increase in the CA125. And what we realized was in spite of doing the parabiotic dissection, they had done a parabiotic dissection with open. We realized that there was a node sitting in the inter cable region. And that was the only reason for increasing CA125. We took out the node laparoscopically and that was the end of the story. The patient is still surviving. So these are all the peritoneal nodules which can be lost on PET scan, which may not be seen. 40% false negative rate with PET scan. You take out the nodule and that's the end of the story. So second loop surgery is very, very important. But what is important is that port site metastasis can be seen. You have to be very, very careful about that. And that is very important. Can you use laparoscopy for HIPEC? Of course, you can use it for HIPEC. So this is another role of laparoscopy in ovarian cancer. This are the uh, when you have given um, all types of chemotherapy, 
this is how you should do a laparoscopic hypec. We have now done a multiples of hypec. You can see these are the tubings which go inside and then you give hyperthermic cisplatinum or oxyplatinum inside. Keep it there for one and a half hours. And after that, you can see that all the peritoneal small deposits which are there, they completely disappear. This is a very, very good treatment, laparoscopic intrathermal uh, uh, chemotherapy, which is important. So most of these recurrences can be treated. Now, this is the vaginal recurrences, which we are seeing. So there is a role of laparoscopy when you get vaginal recurrences after uh, cancer cervix or after doing, and this parametrectomy can be done. So very simple to do it. We should not be showing all this, but this is a simple thing to do. So there is a role of laparoscopy when you get vault recurrence after chemotherapy and radiation. And salvage surgeries for malignant recurrences are feasible. Local regional recurrences are amenable to surgical treatment. Close uh, treatment and minimal access surgery definitely reduces the morbidity. Lastly, can we do something which is very important? This is for vulval cancers. We have now started doing for vulval cancers what is called as inguinal block dissection. So you can see, if you remember, when you did bilateral inguinal node dissection, lot of lymphoria, lot of flap necrosis, but this can be done very easily laparoscopically. You see, this is very simple. Femoral artery, saphenous vein, all the nodes can be taken out. This is for all, this is the femoral vein, which you can see, and all the nodes can be taken out. Considerably less seroma, no flap necrosis, less chance of vascular injury, and one of the easiest procedure to be done can be done under just spinal anesthesia, but avoids a lot of morbidity. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, laparoscopy is feasible in each gynec surgery. There is a definite role of laparoscopy in gynecology. It reduces the morbidity. What is more important is to understand that there is a changing rule which has come in. That is, newer modalities like ICG, HIPEC can help in giving better survival. So laparoscopy is changing in the era with this. And most important thing is to understand the skills of the surgeon important. Predictive anatomy is important. So if you even you have Anything now with the robotic surgery, you can do various kinds of surgery. I'm not going to show you. And therefore, it is very important to understand that there is a role of laparoscopy in every, every aspect of gynae oncology. Again, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sneha. Wonderful. And of course, Mukta, my close friend. Mukta, I'm coming on 13th April to Patna at Apollo Spectra. We'll see you there. But it was a great experience. Thank you. Uh, for be, giving me the opportunity and thank you for being the opening batsman for your uh, the presidential or vice presidential campaign that you are going on. All the best. We hope to see you as a vice president next year. Thank, thank you very much. Hi, Deepak. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shailesh. And yes. of course, a great talk as oh, always. With, with so many take-home messages, I'm sure the stalwarts are here and uh, all of us, you know, have gathered so much in spite of all of you being the experts in the field. So I don't think uh, I, this is like the ultimate word from you. And uh, I think Madam Anita Singh or Dr. Prakash Sivedi, sir, if you have some comments, uh, they are welcome. Thank you. No, his talk is so complete. that You remain speechless. Uh, he also, when he is doing surgery, push, 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 end of the story. That belongs to this Anita Singh, madam, you can, because I and Sailesh and Deepak and all are so close that uh, there are, um, uh, in a month at least sometimes we meet three times. So I think Anita Singh, madam, but uh, he, he Sailesh is too good and uh, Deepak you, is sir. fantastic. Actually, doctor, uh, what I thought that Dr. Sailesh has shown th something which I thought, used to think that it is impossible, he made it possible. And he should train many surgeons because we do have large number of malignancy patients in our country. And by looking at your surgery and the ways you could do it, it will be a I mean, blessing for those patients who will suffer less and less. So you must train as number of people you can. So sure, that, sure, madam. Thank and you. And if it goes to even to the periphery and all the places, it is not possible for everyone to reach to you and get something done like that. That so, is the reason but, every Saturday, Sunday, madam, I'm traveling and doing workshops. Okay. Yes. okay. I, we are so thankful Patna. to you. So, Patna, I'll see you. Last year I was there yes. with Mukta's workshop. Mukta did a great job and you were there. So, 
I'll be coming on 13th April. I'll sure. see you then again, madam. We all, meet, we all will meet there. Yes. And we I would just some say that... from Bihar. Get trend like that. Yes. <laughs> I would just agree with Madam Anita Singh that you, we are blessed to have you, Shailesh. And definitely uh, uh, so many patients are being benefited for, by your expertise. Definitely the patients who are suffering from such kinds of malignancy, you are really a miracle of, uh, you know, the angel for all of them. So thank you so much for doing such thank great you, work. Thank you. Thank you. And all the best to you for your endeavor also. Thank you so much. One of them that I learned uh, surgery is uh, oncology laparoscopically by watching Silas Puntambekar sir's videos and conference. I constantly followed him wherever he was doing surgery. And uh, I learned almost many things about the oncology in a laparoscopy by Dr. Silas Puntambekar sir. He is a great... Thank you. Uh, thank you. Nahi, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And we had a great time coming back from Varanasi. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Mukta. Yeah. So here we have one more join uh, from the field of uh, gynae endoscopy. And the topic for us uh, is uh, expect the unexpected uh, intraoperative management, these thunderbolt discoveries. Uh, I'm sure, uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, it will be um, it will be equally marvelous to uh, hear from you and watch all your videos. So without much ado, I hand over the mic to you and uh, the forum is all yours. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for accepting the invitation and joining. Thank you so much. Very much uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, event invitation. And uh, Prakash sir, good evening. Mangla ma'am, good evening. And uh, uh, ma'am, to you too also. Uh, my topic is about, uh, it's not about the complication, but a certain uh, this kind of the thunderbolt discovery and how you manage it. So we need to prepare for any kind of uh, this uh, uh, discoveries and uh, you should be uh, how to manage it. Chalo. Uh, do you have a screen, ma'am? Yes, ma we can see your screen. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, this is a case of the peritoneal endometrial adenocarcinoma with endometriosis. This is a really amazing case. She was uh, presented with the case of the endometriosis. She had a uh, uh, menorrhagia, painful period, dyspareunia. And USG showed that uh, she is having adenomyosis with the left ovarian endometrioma. Additionally, there was a 6 by 6 centimeter nodule over the pelvic peritoneum. Now, coming to the intraperitoneal video, here this is view of the obliterated pouch of the Douglas. Here you can see that. And the right ovary is absolutely normal and the left ovary is having a endometrium. Now this is a weight uh, for addition of the omentum. So we can see with the uh, uh, suction cannula, it can be uh, mobilized. And there was a hematoma-like uh, mass over the peritoneum. Here we can see. And the fallopian tube is embedded into it. And now here you can see I pull it out and the fimbrial end was into this hematoma. So I uh, believe this is a hematoma and something uh, abnormal. So I excise it uh, radically with the peritoneal basement and sent it for the frozen section. And uh, it confirmed that uh, this is a endometrioid adenocarcinoma over the peritoneum. And then we completed this surgery as a C endometrium. And we did. Uh, this uh, pelvic and the para and omentectomy and uh, uh, fallopian tube uh, showed uh, uh, there was a uh, endometrioid variety malignancy. There was no malignancy in an endometrium. There was no malignancy into the uh, ovary, but uh, the malignancy was into the uh, peritoneum. This was published uh, as a case report of the endometriosis associated with the peritoneal endometrial adenocarcinoma. Now, coming to the barb suture causing small bowel obstruction, patient uh, underwent sacropulpopexy uh, and after three days, he presented with excessive vomiting with abdominal distension. And uh, here, this is a CT uh, uh, contrast CT view and there was a dilated small bowel up to 30 3.5 mm and this is a video of the primary surgery 
So we cannot expect the bowel obstruction in case of the sacrocolpopexy. This is a clean cut surgery. And here you can see I peritonize the mesh with the VLOC20. And uh, I cut it and uh, the end is flushed into the peritoneum. This is absolutely normal view. After three days, on a re-exploration, here you can see ballooned small bowel with the congestion here. So we started following that uh, conge congested and uh, enlarged bowel. And here we can see deflated bowel distal to the obstruction. So we make it out the junction of the obstruction here. And uh, this was not expected how it can happen. But here we can see the end of the VLOG suture material embedded into the mesentery of the small bowel after traversing the superior surface of the small bowel. So I am very lucky surgeon and uh, I was saved that it was not infiltrated, in, uh, punctured the small bowel. But here now the thread is out of this obstruction. Here you can see. And now uh, obstruction is uh, gradually getting relieved. Now this is a divided and here. Now this obstruction is going to be relieved and here we can see the impression of the barb suture material over the small bowel serosa. So we need to be prepared. That's why I showed you the primary surgery. That was a totally flushly cut to the peritoneum. Now probab uh, probable mechanism that due to peritoneal contraction happens and this, uh, uh, this could be pulled out. Method of the prevention, nothing is 100% effective. Surgical clip application at the tail end, burying suture tail end, application of the adhesion barrier, but nothing is effective. Now, uh, the, this is association of the endometriosis with the... Uh, I, I took the patient for the C endometrium and the C colon together, but and in this case, we found uh, there was a grade for endometriosis here. Now, here, this is the first view. This is obliterated pouch of the Douglas dried endometriosis. And in endometriosis, we need to start from normal to the abnormal area, safeguard the ureter from sacral promontory on both sides and enter into the pararectal space and save the nerve. And in oncology, when there is endometriosis, always remove all the nodules cause this is a precursor for the malignancy also because these nodules are secreting the abnormal hormones. So this was excised and she doesn't require resection and anastomosis. Now we proceeded for pelvic lymphadenectomy here and uh, this is obturator now. And here, after that, we retrieve the specimen by putting an endobac Omentectomy carried out in this patient because it was a endometroid adenocarcinoma and uh, vault closed. Now approaching for hemicolectomy. Here you can see an ascending column. She is having uh, this mass but limited to that uh, uh, region and uh, so we plan to do hemicolectomy. Clipping of the artery is done. Ilium divided. Now transverse column here. Window done and linear stapler inserted. Side by side anastomosis carried out. Now this rent is going to be closed with the VLOG. So here, this is a peak of the ascending colon mass. Now, periotic is completed in this lady.
The peritoneum is incised over the right common iliac artery. I'm standing on the right side of the patient for the periaortic. So I first start from the right common iliac artery and uh, approaching toward the left uh, renal vein. Here we can see the, all the margins on a uh, distally, that is the left renal vein. Here the bifurcation of the aorta on both sides, the psoas muscle and the ureter that is safeguarded. Then remove all the fibro fatty tissue over the aorta, common iliac artery, in, uh, inferior mesenteric artery and the, uh, this uh, inferior vena cava. So final histopatho report confirmed uh, carcinoma endometrium ascending column mucinous adenocarcinoma. Genetic analysis were done and she had a Lynch syndrome 2 MS1 as gene positive. No adjuvant treatment was given to this patient. Is under observation. She is absolutely fine. Now, uh, this is a published uh, as a case report of the endometriosis with the synchronous carcinoma endometrium of the uterus and carci uh, carcinoma of the ascending column. Association is a or coincidental. Now, coming to bowel endometriosis causing more than 70% of the stenosis. Now, she was a young lady, 42 years. She presented with severe dysmenorrhea, dyskesia, dyspareunia, right sided gluteal pain, lower limb pain. And uh, MRI showed there is a nodular rectum vaginal space with the bilateral ovarian endometrium. And here, in the per of, uh, first view, we see rectum is okay. She wouldn't require to do anything. Just we will proceed TLH and BSO. But what happened next is amazing that she was uh, given a long time Dinogest and the lipride and so what happens the uh, pelvic uh, endometriosis become localized to the particular part of the uh, that uh, epicenter as Sanjay Patel says the epicenter that becomes a localized part and that is a more affected. So in this case uh, the affected part was the rectum and I will show you this is the affected part here you can see that and it's a totally dry. The rectum is separated from the posterior. Here you can see the totally structured part of the rectum. This part. Then, by observing this, we plan to do resection and anastomosis. So, patient, on base of the MRI, so we are, uh, we were unable to say preoperatively to this patient that uh, she would require resection and anastomosis. After that, we decided to do MRI colonography. That is a very good thing that will show you about the uh, severity of the rectal structure. This end-to-end -end anastomosis carried out in this lady and uh, she is absolutely fine. Uh, bowel endometriosis management by this is a, uh, about the techniques of the resection anastomosis. So we are not uh, 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 retrieving the proximal part of the sigmoid colon to insert this uh, anvil and we do the intracorporeal anvil fixation by our we gynecologists are really good in endo suturing. So I started doing this thing and nowadays linear stapler even we are not applying at the distal end. We do the purse string suturing over the circular stapler and that is a single stapling technique what we are using right now that SST is a having a half percent of the incidence of the recurrence compared to the DST, the double stapling technique. You are using the linear stapling and through the linear stapler you are going to fire circular stapler in that case is the incidence of the leak by the dog ear is a double than a single stapling technique. Now this is a case of the rudimentary anahatan, rudimentary uh, horn with the affecting the hydro, uh, affecting the ureter. She was uh, just uh, 16 years with the uh, complaint of the dysmenorrhea amara showed right rudimentary horn and deep infiltrating endometriosis on the right side. So we are thinking, okay, she, uh, we will just uh, scrap all this thing and the ureter will be fine. And here in a video, you see what happens. Oh, sorry. So this is the right side here, rudimentary horn. Ureter identified. Hydro ureter is there. Working on the medial side of the ureter. 
but this was a long standing uh, although patient was a uh, 16 years but uh, this is a this is since the onset of the menarche so this is a, a longer time disease and uh, it becomes dried the rectum is separated this is a inferior hypogastric now on right side that is a spare now following the ureter from normal to the abnormal here we can see this is the starting of the affected area of the ureter so i thought this would be over and with the use of the divergent force of the grasper and the scissor i cannot use the energy any kind of the energy here the reason the energy will definitely going to chew the tissue and will not allow me to enter into the proper plane so i can ignore certain oozing and the bleeding now what i started to remove that rudimentary horn to get the adequate space to work on the ureter at the level of the ureteric tunnel this uh, rudimentary horn is excised and now here you can see the ureter is completely visible at the level of the ureteric tunnel okay. section it looks like some uh, uh, nodule uh, in this region which is uh, having a chocolate color and here you can see now after dissecting it is a angle thin the ureter here and the chocolate fluid came out of it looks like uh, it is coming out of the ureter so usually we love to do we like to do okay we will do the ureteric implantation but we lose by implanting the ureter the natural orifice so i think uh, before implanting the ureter let me uh, scrap this uh, endometriotic and let's see what happens so uh, after this surgery we have stopped doing we are avoiding not stop we are avoiding to do ureteric implantation as much as possible to preserve the natural uh, ureteric orifice function now here you can see with the scissor and traction and the counter traction i started working on a medial border of the ureter assuming the ureter will cut we will do certain management and this not do that was a compressing the ureter is relieved and the ureter is saved no need of the ureteric implantation now isolated depend uh, deep infiltrating endometriosis at the ureter if you see this video uh, first view there is no there is no single percent evidence of the endometriosis here you can see but uh, she had a hydro ureter so started working on a medial side of the left ureter here you can see this is a hydro ureter now uh, there was no stone and uh, she had a hydro ureter and started following the ureter's medial surface then uh, i need to work on the lateral border of the ureter as well and taken the uterine artery the parametrium was affected so i dissected the paravesical space pararectal space and here now i again grab the ureter and uh, usually i don't grab the ureter but i in this case i need to catch it and uh, here you can see this is endometriotic cyst only in this area while the pod was absolutely normal and i followed ureter completely and removed this part now some part of the endometriotic is over the ureter that will be excised so this is a left side of the parametrium was totally affected that was excised here and the ureter is dissected till its entry into the bladder now this part i need to remove otherwise it can regrow and uh, so started removing this affected meso ureter and here you can see it is a fibrous band so i need to remove this fibrosis 360 degree otherwise it can recur and after doing this surgery i prefer to insert the digestant for the prophylactic purpose for 3 weeks so this is a final end of view now coming to the case of the abdominal wall endometriosis nowadays is very much common so we excise the anterior uh, abdominal wall endometriosis but to make a practice to insert the scope to get the tail extension 
In this case, we inserted the scope and what we see, this was infiltrating into the um, extra iliac uh, lymph nodes and uh, this area here you can see. And uh, I started from normal to the abnormal, lateral to the extra iliac artery. And here, first of all, the left uh, right side extra iliac artery is uh, safeguarded. And then I started from the anterior abdominal wall and uh, I approach from cranial to the distal part. Whatever is there, we need to excise it from the nor uh, uh, to get the healthy margin. Then we can restore the anatomy by suturing the sheath and the muscles. And here you can see there is a chocolate material coming out of this disease. So from where to cut, a, uh, that is a normal healthy tissue. How we can uh, identify that is a loose areolar tissue that gets stretched easily with the stroke. That is the normal margin. Now this nod, Rosenmuller lymph nodes is removed and uh, this area weakened part is sutured with the Voilock. So this is a, here this is a biopsy report that is a nodule from the fossa of the Rosenmuller that uh, nod, uh, lymph nodes was positive for the endometriosis. Now coming to the injury at the inferior vena caval vessel series. <laughs> okay, for the paraortic lymph node dissection, this is junction of the right gonadal vein draining to the IVC. And at the junction, there was a small breach of the gonadal vein and uh, that was not so much bleeding, but uh, we tried to clean it and observe the severity of this bleeding. Then I thought, let's okay, uh, we can clip it with the hemolog clip. You can appreciate the junction, which is bridge here. Two clips applied. Then started crying uh, loudly and now I need to switch it with the Prolin 5.0. So suturing is a bit uh, better option. Now, uh, this is a, a, here you can see the fellow vein draining into the IVC. And this is a due to, see the traction was not sliding movement was given to the lymph node and it started bleeding this fellow vein and the common reflex by the gynecologist is to get the bipolar and you fire the bipolar over this uh, bleeder. And these are the small uh, fellow vein having a not so much muscles and immediately that uh, a venous wall get a uh, burnout and it becomes a part of the IVC. Now this is a IVC. And what happens? This is a bigger problem for the surgeon. You use a suction, the abdomen gets a deflated and you start firing. And here you can see you are increasing the diameter of the injury by the use of the bipolar. So here, my cameraman is a very amazing and uh, he said, sir, just wait. Itana uh, bleeding nahi hoga. Then he said, he lifted this lymph node here you can see. And with the help of the bipolar uh, carbonized tissue, we can see the crater. By lifting the lymph node, the anterior wall of the IVC was away from inside blood and I got a time to suture it. Again, the gynecologist cannot uh, forget the bipolar. <laughs> and uh, here with the proline 50, this part is the suture. So you should have a very good team. Nowadays, we always keep a two carbon dioxide in supplator ready. We keep the proline 50 into the trolley, not outside, and 
now here you can see it is a switched and after that the mood of the ot was good and we completed paraaortic lymphadenectomy this is a now this time i was little bit uh, mature enough for the injury and its management here you can see i am working somewhere and uh, due to counter traction by the refilling of this inferior vena cava the harmony uh, this uh, venules gets uh, open up here i am working here and the venules gets <laughs> rupture here okay again gynecologist come with the bipolar try to coagulate it and it becomes part of the irc the wall of this venule get burn out with the bipolar and here we can see then rent into the ivc by this time you can appreciate the hand movement for the suturing is a matured <laughs> for the ivc suturing so the first suturing i was little bit shaky and after that i managed around five cases of the now date is not happening patchwood and after that we completed the paraaortic lymphadenectomy now management of the injury at the ivc taking suture at the injury site is the better and avoiding undue sliding movement avoid counter traction you should have a very good anesthetist ask him uh, that refilling of this uh, filling and refilling of the ivc is giving a counter traction to uh, your uh, harmonic and harmonic can divide this venules very fast now uh, this is a injury at the uh, right uh, from a uh, common iliac vein junction where uh, interiliac vein is going to drain and uh, to the extra iliac vein so i am working on a lateral border of uh, extra iliac vein and here you can see this and it is divided and i grab it this is a injury site and here the lower uh, low uh, uh, interiliac vein is grabbed by the my assistant bharat and here the bleeding starts and grab it again the amount of the bleeding is worried and worried some and uh, was catch with the grasper and clip applied on two parts the suture was ready fortunately with the help of the clip this bleeding stop now complication of the primary entry in a laparoscopy so this was the injury done by the 5 mm trocar entry and uh, this was a case of the tls in 2013 and uh, here some additions and everything so first of all i am going to show you some videos about the uh, tls this is a uh, this will take around one or two minutes so this is a case you can attend the can to previous section the bladder is separated cardinal ligament and uh, right side uterine artery cardinal ligament and at the time of the colpotomy we applied the screw and what we see at the sacral promontory there was a big hematoma here oh how it happens that was worried and this was a very some hematoma and uh, we started hunting what was wrong surgeon never said that it is a his mistake but that was a my mistake i inserted primary entry with the 5 mm trocar patient was thin and lean and thin and lean patients are more vulnerable and this is the site of the injury patient was kept in icu for 28 pcv given and uh, there was no need of re exploration and no need of the exploration of this peritoneum and uh, tamponade happens and uh, it was a self control and self manage
Now, complication primary entry in the laparoscopy, where is needle induced? This is again, the TLH is done by trainee here. And this was the previous section. So at the end of the TLH, what we see by withdrawing the scope here, there is a small, small hematoma. What is that? And uh, we started exploring it and uh, this happens in uh, around uh, 11 p.m. And this is a site of the injury by a uh, various needle. And this was uh, not so much worrisome compared to that 5mm. And it was a uh, self-limiting and uh, it doesn't require, it uh, didn't require any kind of the intervention. Now, case of the periurethral uh, um, Now, See, this was a case of the CO ovary and the re-exploration. She had a mass periurethral region and here you can see the hemostasis is completely achieved. We gave a wash, pulpotomy was done to retrieve the specimen. This was re-look laparoscopy for uh, CO ovary and on a re-exploration of within a 24 hours, there was a hematoma, fresh bleeding. The vitals were not okay and uh, we did a suction and uh, there was a surprise that i'll show you in a video that uh, medial to the ureter peritoneum had uh, some small capillary here you can see that is a pulsatile and it created this disaster and i came out with the complete hemostasis and it was grabbed and it was a bipolar given to this bleeder. Sorry, I need to take this in a slow motion. Ma'am, whenever the time is over, you just let me know. I will finish it off, ma'am. Okay, so this thing happened. Okay, and now coming to this uh, ruptured second trimester ectopic pregnancy patient had taken herself uh, empty pill, uh, self medication pre due to previous one cesarean section. Here you can see the video. I I had a call from a gynecologist. And uh, omentum is here. The uterus is normal, but uh, left broad, liga, uh, uh, broad ligament is having a mass. So I started safeguarding the ureter, safeguarding the vital vessels. This is an extra iliac artery. Now here, again, the principle is that you always start from normal to the abnormal and get the tail of this all vital structure and here we can see this was a umbilical cord and it was resting over the extra iliac vein round ligament divided and the baby came out of this sac and she had a ruptured bladder, ruptured J-shaped uterus, and it was a reconstructed, and it was absolutely fine. Then again, she had a pregnancy, and she delivered by cesarean section in a government hospital. So this was the scene. We can see we can see the manipulator, literal rupture, and the bladder separated. Now we are going to suture 
and reconstructed the uterus. And now coming to the bladder, the vicryl. Now, this is a keratinization also done. And uh, this is the obstetric uh, uh, Dr. Prakash also uh, uh, present in this case. She underwent the obstetric hysterectomy and within a two hour, patient had again bleeding, terrific bleeding. So we started surgery with the, she had a parametrial hematoma. So we entered immediately retroperitoneally and we clipped the intrailiac artery on a both side. She was a hysterectomy, obstetric hysterectomy before two hours for the previous, uh, for twins pregnancy, EPH. And uh, this is the left side of the intrailiac artery. Due to hypovolemia, you can see the vessels are not so much uh, bigger in diameter. Now here, intraperitoneal, there was no hematoma. In a such a case, this kind of the vessel sealing devices are amazing. Here, the ultrasonic energy cannot be so much useful. Separated later and started taking, uh, started working on the parametrium. Literalization of the ureter by working on the ureteric tunnel dissection and by doing the colpotomy here, you can see the bleeding uh, severity. So we pull out And this is the parametrium along with that. And here now this is absolutely clear and she wasn't, she wasn't kept the drain. And she was absolutely fine after two days of the uh, incubation. Now this is the injury at the Dr. urethra. Libachia, Amen. we are going through such interesting cases. We don't feel like leaving it. But yes. there is always a time limit. Uh, and actually more speakers are waiting for the next session. We are getting quite late. So... Amen. Uh, uh, it was uh, actually we didn't want to leave that because yes. everything is a, in itself is a lesson for us. So I think uh, you can uh, now wind up in a few minutes and we'll go to the another speaker who is waiting for long. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Mukta, ma'am, and uh, Anita, ma'am, and Sneha, ma'am, and Srivedi, uh, sir. How are you? Fine. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepak Limbachia. That was an excellent presentation. And all of us were almost lost, you know, engrossed into the presentation, watching your beautiful videos. And what a courage you have. And, you know, uh, lesson to learn for all of us, I think. And uh, it, we didn't yes, want to miss it, but I think definitely some other time we may catch up once again. And uh, okay, thank you for accepting the uh, invitation and being there. Thank you so much. And over to you again, uh, Dr. Mukhtar. Thank you, our re revered speakers. And thank you, our expert persons, for taking this section so beautifully. And now okay, moving uh, on. Madam uh, Rekha Kurian wants to say something. No, I just wanted to say it was a fantastic, uh, scary series that he showed us. But it was fantastic, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Deepak and... Limbasia is always showing us great videos. We all endoscopic surgeons must have access to this particular knowledge, especially managing vascular injuries. I think this was simply superb and always hats off to Deepak. Hats off. Nothing less than that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And now we will move on to the session two of this benchmark series. And for conducting this session, I would like to welcome my extra, my chairpersons. Uh, I welcome Dr. Roekha Korean, ma'am. Ma'am is Director, Joseph Hospital, Chennai. And ma'am is past president of Obstetric and Gynecological Society of Southern India, Vice President Foxy in 2015, Managing Committee Member, IAGE, 
immediate past president south zone aicc rcog and vice chairperson of tamil nadu chapter of iag ma'am has a special interest in endoscopy and infertility we welcome you ma'am and we are grateful that you joined us for this very special webinar i welcome dr arun madha barua sir sir is consultant apollo fertility and hospitals guwahati sir is founder chairperson of northeast isar and northeast iag chapters sir has contributed so many chapters in the textbooks at many publications national international and sir is our own teacher i welcome you sir i welcome Thank dr mangla dogra director dogra nursing home and endoscopy center at chandigarh and former associate professor at pgi chandigarh and ma'am's major area is patient care teaching and research ma'am has an uh, experience of more than 30 years ma'am is founder president of punjab chapter iag past president of Ch uh, chandigarh ops and gynae society and nationally recognized expert in endoscopic surgery so stage is all yours chairperson and please go ahead with the session thank you yeah uh... hello well, hello am i able yes 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 madam yeah so uh, the, the, now the, the first speaker is uh, dr samit patel and he is going to talk on the last stitch tips and tricks of deep infiltrating endometriosis which is a very tricky situation and uh, as far as his resume is concerned he is mbbs from nhl municipal medical college in 2016 ms from again the same hospital and dr sumit patel has been the president of junior doctors association gujarat 2017 to 19 managing committee member of amdavad medical association gujarat his key interest lies in gynae onco surgeries and endometriosis surgeries and expertise in high risk obstetric and gynae laparoscopic surgeries not taking much time i think we should ask him to start the topic <laughs> start his uh, presentation over to you uh, dr sumit uh thank you very much ma'am for a wonderful uh, introduction respected dipak sir prakash trivedi sir um, rekha ma'am arun sir um, shreya ma'am mukta ma'am anita ma'am and everybody here i bow down to everybody uh today i am going to speak on the last stitch i hope the screen is there oh yeah it's audible yeah yes screen as well as well as your audible so i have titled this as the last stitch because uh, we want to always make sure that let this surgery be the last surgery for the patient of endometriosis the last stitch you take on that patient let it be the last stitch it is taken for that patient for the disease endometriosis the mathematics of endometriosis is very simple um the outcome of the surgery is dependent on the aim the method we use the wisdom we have the risk we incur and the excellence we give to the patient the aim is complete eradication of the disease method is effective deployment of the surgical plan <clears throat> wisdom is measured and concise execution of the method risk is any anatomical or intraoperative mishaps dipak sir showed us excellent intraoperative uh, what do we say the risk which he takes while doing the Uh, lymph node samplings and those small minor injuries to the vessels and how effectively he is taken care of those is simply outstanding and excellence is the learned surgical methods we give and the outcome we give to the patient i will be covering three main topics which is the peritoneal involvement endometriosis interna and rectal involvement the first is peritoneal employment and how we take care of it is what we call mayflower butterfly peritonectomy the first step is ureterolysis then we move towards the medial pararectal space dissection the nerve sparing surgery 
we take the upper wings of the butterfly and an end block removal. We'll jump right to the surgery. <clears throat> to do a ureterolysis, the best and effective way is grasping the loose folds over the ureter at the pelvic brim. Attraction and counter traction is given, and the ureter is opened in a layer by layer fashion. I call it a simple tease and cut method when it's a simple surgery or a layer by layer laminar fashion. And we dissect the tissue, the endometriotic tissue, the plaque surrounding the ureter, and we make ureter free from all those things. One thing to be kept in mind is that we always preserve the mesentery of the ureter. After that, we take a J-shaped curve towards the center of the pelvis and we remove those endometriotic spots there also. The next is we enter into the medial pararectal space. We give traction towards the medial end holding the colon and we enter into the medial pararectal space. Here we keep in mind that the fat will belong to the colon and we keep the fat towards the colon. In the process of doing so, we'll come across an important organ which is the hypogastric nerve. You can see that clearly, and we should always preserve that. Even though it has the organ, the bladder and the colon has supply from the S2, S3, S4 segment, but the morbidity of the patient will be reduced to a great extent if a nerve sparing surgery is done. Following that, we'll enter into the denonvillous fascia. You can clearly see the denonvillous fascia opened here. Post that, we'll take the upper wings of the butterfly. These are the areas in the posterior aspect of the ovaries, the ovarian fossas the uh, infected part near the IP ligament. Most of the times, this is the nodule which most of us misses out and taking care of these nodules or removing these nodules will give us <clears throat> an excellent tubo-ovarian relationship. At the end, once we have made sure that the lateral pelvic vessels are towards the lateral side, the ureter is lateralized, the inferior mesenteric uh, vein, sorry, the nerve and the colon is medialized and then whatever is left between that is the infected peritoneum or the endometriotic nodules or plaque. We remove them and we try to remove them in an end bulk fashion and you can see a beautiful butterfly kind of shaped whole uh, endometriotic which is coming out of it. This is the butterfly, the wings of the butterfly, the lower wings of the butterfly, and you can see the hypogastric nerve, rectum, and letter, the ureter and the lateral vessels are completely not disturbed or not injured. <clears throat> Next, we come towards the endometriosis interna. The first step is always a proper radiological mapping. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Patel's classification, and the techniques which we use is the hood technique, elliptical technique, or uh, the slice technique, suturing, and the data which we present. Um, any form of radiologic mapping is ideal for this. One can use sonography, one can use an MRI. The classification includes 1A, which is the posterior aspect, and it is less than 3 centimeter. 1B, a few lesions with few areas of diffuseness. The 2A, we enter into the big sizes, which is greater than 3 cm and scattered area of diffuse disease. 2B is involvement up to the half of the uterus. Grade 3 is disease involving entire uterus. Now we write, <clears throat> we jump right to the surgical techniques. Is The first one is the hood technique. Here, the method is more or less like a myoma removal, but in case of myomectomy, we can see that the fibroid comes out when we have enough space and traction and counter traction is there. We enter into the right place, the fibroid is just going to pop out. In this case, in case of adenoma, we actually have to dig that tissue out. You can see here that this volcanic spots should not be left behind. So once we remove the uh, major part of the adenoma, we'll again dive right into the diseased area and remove that part of the tissue which is left behind also. The next is the elliptical dissections. In this, 
uh, once the vasopressin effect is achieved, we map the whole area which is to be removed. A central deep incision is made. So in elliptical format, like we slice an apple, we are going to slice over the uterus. The central area is going to be deep and towards the periphery, we are going to be more superficial. So it will be a kind of wedge shaped resection, which is going to come out. You can see here that the beautiful wedge shaped nodule is coming out. A similar procedure will be done on the opposite side, the same way towards the periphery, we are going to be more superficial and a deep midline uh, incision is there. Again, the same wedge shape is removed and then we sort out to the suturing techniques. The suturing in adenoma is very peculiar here because we see that it is almost like of myomectomy, but we make sure that towards the center here, we don't take the tissue bite and towards the periphery, we take thick chunks so that the tissue is approximated. <clears throat> you can see the final picture here. There is also a slip knot technique. If you are going to use Vicryl, we do a slip knot technique. The throws of the sutures are passed. The first throw is taken. And then the second throw is there. We slide the whole knot toward one side and push it over. And then we take the other rounds of the throw. In case of disease where it is grade three and uh, the fertility is desired and the whole uterus is adenomatic, we resort to the slice technique. In this technique, we first take the uterine arteries at the origin. It's, it is a very old video, hence the quality would not be proper. We start with a central incision, same as in elliptical technique, but in this case, the central and the peripheral incisions are going to be of the same depth. And at the end, we'll have something, a tissue coming out in a sliced form. The way, instead of a wedge uh, apple we cut, we take the whole sliced apple, the half apple, out of the uterus. There's a small graphical presentation also at the end, I guess. And at the end, we don't suture this back in the slice technique and we make an exit. Uh, from 2008 to 2014, we did 386 localized adenoma out of which diffuse were 85. The 40% carried the localized adenoma in those cases, 40% carried natural preg uh, pregnancy and diffuse disease was 20%. So lesser the grade, the more chances of the patient being pregnant and more the grade, the patient was more towards less chances of pregnancy. The symptomatic relief was absolutely great. Dysmenorrhea, 92% of the patient had symptomatic relief. Menstrual loss was there in 84%. Recurrence rate after three years was somewhere around 38%. And this recurrence rate was more, mostly in grade 2B and 3. Now we come to the bowel endometriosis. We present you the rule of M, the superficial involvement, the mucosal involvement, and the circumferential involvement. So what is rule of M? Over the transverse section of the colon, let us vision a letter M on it. Now, if the no involvement of endometriosis is up to the level of mucosa and less than 30% of the circumference, we go for anterior discoid resection. If the involvement is not covering the mucosa and less than 30% of the circumference, irrespective of the length, we will go for rectal shaving. And if the involvement is more than 30%, we will move towards resection and anastomosis. We dive right into the surgical treatment. <clears throat> Here you can see the MRI of the patient. Here you can see a small nodule which is infiltrating into the colon, but not to the level of mucosa. The mucosa is still intact. In this case, a stay sutures are taken. The rest of the endometriotic nodules are removed. 
the nodule over the colon is grasped firmly and with the help of harmony the nodule is felt and it is being dissected off from the colon you can see the rectal nodule being shaved off we'll again check for any residual nodule if we have left behind anything and then we'll come to the closure of the colon in this case we have used vicryl 30 in a continuous non locking fashion we can also use vlock 30 there's no problem and we have had excellent results with the same the first row is made angle secured non locking sutures taken and towards the end again the angle is taken and secured a few reinforcement sutures taken and then a tire puncture test is done coming to the second category where the circumferential involvement is less than 30% but the mucosa is involved in this case we resort to anterior discoid dissection first of all all the endometriotic nodules are removed you can see the butterfly area being removed here now we jump to the colon we assess the nodule the first step is removal of fat surrounding the nodule it will always give you a walder kind of picture so fat once removed will give us a clear idea where the nodule is once the fat is removed we'll again feel the nodule grasp it firmly and slowly and steadily dissect the nodule surrounding the colon in this case it is going to open the colon you can see right here and we generally tend to keep around point 5 cm of free space there for fresh nodules in case of anterior discoid dissection the suturing is very peculiar we do it in two layers the first layer is interrupted and the second layer is also interrupted in this case and it is always in a transverse fashion now we come to the third part where <clears throat> the involvement of the colon is great it is more than 30% of the circumference such cases qualify for resection and anastomosis we are strong believer of conservative surgery organ sparing surgery but some cases does require an anatomical alterations of the organ itself this is a prime example of that the first step is always entering into the medial pararectal space we enter into the medial pararectal space and below the medial pararectal space we enter into the holy planes the similar step is done on the opposite side as well from both the holy spaces it would be dissected off from the base and it would be whole the inferior mesentic vessels are clipped you can have a multiple variation of two arteries and one vein or two veins and two arteries the veins are always one and one but arteries should be two and one then towards the distal end a linear stapler is being fired the involved colon is delivered out through a small incision of just 5 cm on the anterior abdominal wall the dissected part of the colon is taken out envil is inserted and bursting sutures are taken surrounding it the colon is again delivered back inside the abdomen closed in layers and the circular stapler is inserted from below and we make sure that the marge is the two stapler lines are not interacting and the circular stapler is fired you can see two healthy donuts here these are the signs of complete anastomosis and a healthy anastomosis you can see the involvement of the colon the mushroom shaped appearance the advantages of conservative tailor made approach consists of a constant improvement in pain quality of life gastrointestinal scores genitourinary tract symptoms and fertility and 
taking a conservative approach also leads to decrease in LAS syndrome. LAS syndrome is basically an internal anal dysfunction, decrease in anal canal sensation, disappearance of recto anal inhibitory reflex, and reduction in rector reservoir capacity. So basically, we try to promote an organ sparing surgery. Deepak has said wonderfully that you should always try to preserve the ureter. Implantation is never the answer. <clears throat> Same way for the colon also, for the ureters, all the important organs, we should always try to be conservative for that. And if needed, only then go for an anatomy altering procedure. The disease, the treatment should not be worse than the disease. That is what we believe in. From year 2017 to 18, we operated around 617 patients of endometriosis and we have been taking a follow-up of those patients till today, which is around 24. <clears throat> the, if you look at the pain scores before the surgery and after the surgery, we have got drastically improvement in the pain scores for almost majority of the patients. The quality of life before the surgery was very bad and after the surgery, most of them have a very good quality of life. The recurrence rate is a mere 1.8% compared to the publications and the research which we see is around 20 to 67%. 48% of our patients carry natural pregnancy in the first three months itself and 42% of our patients carry pregnancy via IVF in the first cycle. A few of our post-operative complications which are fever, UTI, diarrhea, constipation, urinary retention, and voiding difficulties. So endometriosis is a continuous progressive disease. We as a surgeon have some limitations. A complete total approach, but staying conservative is the gap which we should be gapping in. We have to always make sure the patient is free of the disease and also make sure that the recurrence rate is very less. Hence, let us come to a conclusion that the last stage we take on the patient is always the last stage the patient has for the disease. Poland is one of our um, newsletters. Feel free to subscribe it. And thank you very much, everybody, for the patient hearing. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much, Smith. I think it was a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. uh, hello? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hello. Yes. You may go. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Smith. I think it was a very nice talk on how the patient, uh, uh, you know, this uh, in endometriosis, the patient has minimum three, four surgeries if uh, you do not think of completion. So every bit of endometriosis must be re removed and which you stressed upon um, and the butterfly technique as well. <laughs> The bowel also, uh, many of us do not do so much of bowel, but I think when bowel is, uh, we do up to disc uh, resection, but not end-to-end -end anastomosis. But I think eventually you will have to get a surgeon also on board so that you can do these uh, bowel resections as well. So very wonderful uh, dissections you showed us, me. Uh, any other mm -hmm. questions from the audience? Um. I don't think Let's that... move to the next one now. Yeah, we will go on to the next one. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> well done. So, Dr. Milin. Yeah, the next top is, uh, topic is advances in hysteroscopy. And uh, Dr. Milin Talan is, uh, can I have his CV? Yeah. He is a uh, professor of uh, Symbiosis Medical College for uh, women in Pune and a diploma in laparoscopy from Keele University. He has fellowship in hysteroscopy and uh, is a consultant at Galaxy Hospital Pune. He is a member of FOXI, IAG, AAGL and also has many video presentations at AAGL uh, and in Barcelona. He had the best video award in 2017 Global Hysteroscopy Congress. And he's chief gynecologist at First Indian Uterine Transplant Team and delivered the first uterine transplant mother of India in 2018. Uh, welcome, Dr. Melintala. And over to you for your talk. Yeah. 
I hope I'm audible. Thank you, ma'am, yeah. for the wow. kind words. And uh, without wasting time, I will share my screen. I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I will start. And my topic is slightly different than what the previous three speakers have given. But this is the crux for the gynecologist. Hysteroscopy, according to me, is his birthright. So, advances in hysteroscopy, the techniques and technology has improved for better patient compliance and the desire to basically operate within a restricted cavity has made it advanced to the level which is today and people today are recognizing them as intrauterine surgeons. So let's see the evolution and the concept. Philip Ponsini has been credited with the evolution of Lich Lighter, which he used to see body cavities way back in 1805. And he was the person who brought in the concept that if the two fingers of the gynecologist get vision, then they will not err. From there, it took nearly 60 years till DC Pantaloni using the Antonin cystoscope did the first cystoscopy and then fulgurated a postmenopausal polyp. So it took 60 years and lot of work in the field of hysteroscopy to which to where we are now at present. The reason is very simple. In laparoscopy, you have a big region. You are the abdominal cavity. But in hysteroscopy, you have a virtual dynamic cavity. It bleeds every month. There is inability to distend and the light transmission is difficult. So till the optics were not developed properly, till we didn't have the distension media, we could not have a proper vision of the uterine cavity. And the credit goes to Professor Harold Hopkins who devised the rod lens system so as to get proper vision, which had no aberration, and to Carl Storz, who then created the cold light source to be thrown in. Subsequently, many investigators, Professor Lindemann used carbon dioxide, Sujimoto brought in normal saline to distend the cavity, and this made our life slightly easy. But the desire to operate still went on, and it was Newworth in 1981, who, with the help of the cystoscope, and the unipolar current did the first hysteroscopic myomectomy. But officially, the resectoscope for gynecologists was developed by Halles in 1987 and in 1981, US FDA approved it for use. So it took a lot of time for the hysteroscopy to develop to the present era. And a salute to these two people who brought in what we see today, to Jack Samu from Paris, who developed the first 4mm hysteroscope and the Colpo microhistoscope. He went on to then devise the endomat and then to Stefano Petoki, who in early 1990 brought in the miniaturization of scopes to the office hysteroscopes, to the vaginoscopic technique, and then he propagated the use of normal saline. So from scientific curiosity, we came to a technique of clinical value. And today it is the gold standard for evaluation of endometrial cavity. So in my journey, when I was a resident, you can see these pictures, how I went on. And today you also have what is known as the endo C or the pocket hysteroscope. Though it, the vision is not good, but it can be used to just do a diagnostic hysteroscopy. So the change is for good, for patient compliance, for desire to finish off intrauterine pathologies within, within the uterine cavity. And therefore, the dimensions of the scope changed from 1980 to 1990. No, we went from small book. Hello? So we went from the Colpo microhistroscope to the office hystroscope from end endomats, which was the HAMU, to the endomat for the office hystroscopy. And the scopes also changed completely with now adding an operative channel. And so the miniaturization of scopes brought in the operative component into it. And we could use the five French uh, instruments like the graspers, the scissors, the tinaculums, and therefore we progress to the present. 
Then from the electrocautery, that is from monopolar current, the resectoscopes to bipolar current, and subsequently now we have the mechanical. The purpose is very simple. To retrieve the tissue, we should not do any blind procedures in the cavity. We should say no to DNC. So therefore, we progressed in innovations in technique and technology so as to derive or retrieve the tissue under vision. And therefore, from electrocautery, resectoscopes, we went on to also the mechanical tissue retrieval systems, which are now used very much in the United States and Europe and sparingly still in India. So what happened? The new philosophy, because of conforming to the anatomy of the uterus, was we could go in without the speculum, the vulcellum, the vaginoscopic technique or the non-touch technique, and we could see the pathology. And because of the operative nature of the scopes, we could treat it in the same setting. And this has made it as office operative hysteroscopy. We shifted from monopolar and glycine to bipolar and normal saline, making it increasingly safe procedure for the patient. So this is one thing where the complications have to be minimalistic or no complications in hysteroscopy. We should not have morbidity in hysteroscopy. Leave aside mortality. So because of the miniature scopes, the normal saline, the bipolar current, the five French instruments, good optics, and the vaginoscopic technique, we could migrate from the operative room to the office hysteroscopy, which should be the norm in all tertiary care hospitals now. So this is the setup which we created in uh, Galaxy, wherein we don't have a crash cart, we don't have IV fluid, no sets, nothing. The patient walks in and walks out and does the same procedure which you would have done maybe 20 years back in the OR. Coming to the mechanical tissue retrieval systems, it's a boon to the new coming hysteroscopic surgeon. It was devised by Dr. Mark Hans Emanuel from Amsterdam and it was approved by US FDA in 2005. Now there are two variants, the Mayo Shiva Bigati, and as I speak now also, you have the Hologic coming up with a tissue retrieval system and many Chinese companies coming up with disposable tissue retrieval systems. So they work, they are zero degree, their length is much, they have different diameters, different window sizes, and they work for the office as well as for the OR. The purpose is very simple. It works on the mechanical principles, no current to be used. It cuts and aspirates the tissue under vision. So single insertion and all the tissue being collected properly. And the time taken is decided by the contact of the window directly with the pathology. And if the pathology is dancing to your tunes, mind you, you're doing a great job. The speed of the blade is already decided by the motor and therefore it will cut at its own pace. So our learning curve then considerably decreases as, complete, as com uh, compared to resectoscopy, wherein our each move has to be such that we take a big chip. The chip should not come in front of us. The air bubble should not come in front of us. And therefore, it, the learning curve with resectoscopy is bigger. And even it has been proven by this paper that the mentors had to take over in the resectoscopy vis-a-vis -vis in uh, mechanical tissue retrieval systems. The chances of takeover by the mentors were less. And it's not just a gimmick. You get adequate tissue, you can have complete removal, no damage to the surrounding endometrium, reducing operative time, reducing complications, less fluid deficit, and therefore also because of its miniature size can be used in office. So this I've already told you that morcellation is more motor driven, scope driven, while resectoscopy is more surgeon driven with more time taken by the surgeon to learn the procedure. Have the indications changed? The indications have remained the same, but now you can use hysteroscopy in postmenopausal bleeding. You can use hysteroscopy and correction of isthmocele known as the isthmoplasty. RPOCs, no DNC is required. You can do in office RPOC removal. You can use in all patients of uterine anomalies, especially septums in patients with uh, T-shaped uteruses and therefore in infertility. Further, these miniature scopes they go in and they have uh, they, uh, they can easily tackle an intact hymen and therefore can be used in adolescents and virgins. In fact, in post TLH bleedings also, we inspect by hysteroscope the TLH bleeding and you can cauterize it in office. The patient can go home the same day. So you have certain added indications to what the previous indications were there. 
But with this also, we have good imaging techniques which help us in getting hysteroscopy done very easily. And that is the now the enhanced 3D uh, histos uh, sonography, which gives us better view of the uterine cavity and delineates the pathology so that we can decide which instrument to be used and how to use it. Counseling remains the backbone of all hysteroscopy, whether it is a single procedure, it might require a double procedure, and a well-counseled patient is your best ally, more so when you're doing office hysteroscopy. So knowing your patient is very important, just as the banks do the KYC, we should know our KYP. And this is how we counsel the patient. We show them videos, how this is done. We do not wear cap, mask. The patient is just covered. There is no intracath, no IV fluid, no anesthetic seen in this procedure. And we can do a morselation very easily for fibroids less than two centimeters. Polyps of any size can be removed without easily with the tissue retrieval systems. So you can see a change now happening with the miniature scopes. We can go in by vaginoscopic technique. You are seeing two different techniques for polyp removal here, where the pedicle is big, vascular, you can use the bipolar pottery, the five French needle to cut. And if you are seeing that the pedicle is not vascular, you can just merely use the five French grasper, the crocodile grasper to grasp the tissue and push it. You can see both this performed in office and this is extremely important for all those patients of infertility and as you can see that nearly thousand infertile patients showed 32 percent of endometrial polyps and therefore in office targeted removal and under vision retrieval is very important in both the videos you can clearly see here the pedicle is not vascular on the right side on the left side it appears vascular you can use the bipolar five french needle and remove the polyp after cutting the base. And over here, you can directly grasp with the grasper. When you open the five French grasper, it is six mm in width, and easily you can twist and just push as if for a biopsy, and the polyp comes out under vision. So, this is how we can go ahead. Here, you can see I'm using the cautery, the five French bipolar, cutting the pedicle so that the bleeding doesn't take place. You will see later on how the pedicle is wide. So these are different techniques one uses. You can see the raw area and the last part can be just removed by the grasper. So that the entirety polyp is removed in one go in a shorter time. The patient goes on in another half an hour. Similarly, if you have a steno cervix and you're using two different equipments now, one is the grasper to open in C2. And once you open the stenosis, you're finding a polyp bigger than the interloss. And in the lower, you're finding the polyp huge than the interloss. In the upper video, you're using the slicing technique described by Betoki, where you slice the polyp with a five French into multiple pieces and then remove each piece at one time, thereby facilitating the removal of the entire pathology under vision. And in the video below, you can see the tissue retrieval system cutting and aspirating the entire fibromatous polyp in one go and you reach the base without any form of bleeding, vision remaining clear. So this is what the optics, the five range instruments, the miniature instruments have done to hysteroscopy. It has turned the hysteroscopic surgeon into an intrauterine surgeon who respects the endometrial cavity and therefore helps all those patients of infertility or those who want to have pregnancy. Similarly, classifications for RPOC have changed. Now you have the Gutenberg classification used for sonography and it coordinates very well with the hysteroscopy except for type 3 wherein you might require uh, uterine artery embolization or maybe methotrexate initially to decrease the vascularity and then go in with the resectoscope. The up type 0, type 1 and type 2 can be done in office by a tissue retrieval system. And here you can see both the videos now with the grasper and with the MHTR system how easily we can remove. The only problem with the grasper is when it is a huge RPOC, you have to move in and out frequently to remove piece and piece by piece of the RPOC. As you can see in the video, I'll just fast forward the video. Here you can see grasping, twisting and removing. Here you take some time in entering. But once you have entered inside, it becomes few minutes. Job. You're seeing the RPOC and this is known as targeted removal without damaging any other part of the endometrium. So respecting the endometrium 
and still removing the pathology is what is today's hysteroscopy. So these are the advances in each pathology that has taken place and how hysteroscopy is helping the patients with minimal effort. Similarly, in myoma resection, this is the old way we are doing the resectoscope. And here, and here you will see that with the tissue retrieval system, we are able to remove the same myoma. Two different techniques, the older version, which is still in use and should be used for bigger myomas. And this is up to 2 2.5 centimeter myomas. We can do it in office or in anesthesia also. It cuts, aspirates and removes the myoma. No chips floating. And here you might have interference with chips. You have to be faster here. And from the apex to the base you go. Here also we go from the apex to the base. But here it is literally moving into the fibroid and you can reach the base. People think that there is a lot of bleeding. No bleeding takes place with this type of uh, tissue retrieval system. If you remain within the pseudo capsule, mind you, respecting the pseudo capsule is very important. It's the technique which is now we have learned after seeing the pseudo capsule. So remaining in the pseudo capsule, we can remove the myoma completely from the base and clear vision. Similarly, now we get with the help of sonography, we are able to diagnose surface adenomyosis. Smith spoke to us about adenomyosis, which is seen in the myometrium. And this is surface which can be tackled hysteroscopically. And in patients who are for embryo transfers, we can just tackle this adenomyosis by hysteroscopy. We can even use the tissue retrieval system to dig in and remove. And here you can see how we dissect the cyst, the blue cyst open and then remove the adenomyotic cyst completely from within the endometrium without going with a slide with laparoscopy over here. So this is for surface adenomyosis cyst or myometrial cyst pointing towards the endometrium. So this is possible because of miniature hysteroscopes. Now we also have the 15 French resectoscopes which can be used to resect this adenomyotic cyst. Coming this to the next most important thing and which we are finding now day in and out, patients presenting with AUB, secondary infertility, who have previous serious infections, we are finding it that patient is having a niche or isthmocele and this can be corrected by 15 French resectoscope. You are seeing in the figure how we demarcate the niche and then the caudal part is resected. Then you resect the kephalid part and create that pouch into a plain area so that the fluid or the blood doesn't collect and cause stagnation of fluid there, causing infection, endometritis, can cause polyps there, dyspareunia, painful uh, periods, and secondary infertility. So only symptomatic patients have to be treated. Though people say we can correct the scar by laparoscopy, it is Gubini who has documented that in his all patients of infertility, secondary infertility, he found 80% pregnancy rates by a 360 degree clearance of isthmocel with the Gubini resector scope, which is available as 18, 16, and now 14 French also. So here, this is the technique which is used, a definite role for mini hysteroscope which is the new tool that is used to correct isthmocele that can also be used for septum, as you will see later on. So evaluation of postmenopausal bleeding. Now, this is an area which already Dr. Shailesh Puntamekar has spoken, but before that, we have to diagnose uh, cancer and people used to, we were taught to do DNCs to get material, but here we can see that hysteroscopy gives you a very clear picture of what is normal endometrium, which is normal postmenstrual. And here in such a patient, you don't require to take a biopsy also because you're seeing the myometrial fibers, no endometrium seen. And this is a patient where as Lofer described this as a normal postmenopausal uh, cavity. Coming to diagnosis of EINs, hysteroscopy has made it very feasible to observe the abnormal vessels on the endometrium 
the irregular thickening of the endometrium and selected targeted biopsies so you can catch endometrial intraepithelial neoplasias which can go on to manifest and become adenocarcinomas later on so at the earliest when you see that the endometrial thickness is on sonography is thick it is heterogeneous irregular and the patient is complaining of menometroregia you can put in a histoscope and here you can see that abnormal vessels so clearly depicted and you can correlate the macroscopic appearance with the histopathology and you can take a targeted biopsy i'll run the video fast and here you can see a small nodule that is lump and you take a biopsy and it turns out to be endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia so before it progresses to becoming adenocarcinoma you can deal with the patient with the help of histoscopy coming to carcinoma endometrium there is a very good correlation between the images and histology and here this is a classical case of c endometrium for which we won the global award in 2017 here you can highlight how histoscopy helps you by macroscopically seeing a nodular polypoidal lesion you can see areas of calcification here clearly you can see neovascularization you can see loss of arborization these are small calcified areas these are pathognomonic of cancer endometrium neovascularization you can see from where it arises earliest c endometrium arises towards the fundus where a dnc might miss it so you use the histoscope it has a predilection for the left ostia more so histoscopy will catch it much more early secondly it will tell you the spread within the cavity it was garuti who said it more the spread less the prognosis or poor the prognosis it can tell you whether it can come into the cervical canal when the cervical canal is involved as you can see a very good view clearly in histoscopy further we went on to see whether we can do fertility preserving this was a young patient who presented with thickened endometrium and as you can see this is a classical case papillary cerebroid appearance and we tried and we even morselated the entire uh, carcinoma and then we said whether we have done the right thing and then we say, saw that there is a jamic publication wherein it has clearly shown that intrauterine morselation or tissue retrieval system used for morselating the carcinoma doesn't upstage the disease at all and this has been now proven by even the figo so you can remove the entire tumor load and then see whether she is stage 1a or she is a higher stage so numerous studies have assessed the risk of dissemination and it has been proved that you can mention it that the cytology was positive but the stage and the prognosis remains the same for stage 1a if the grade is good that is stage uh, that is ertpia is minimal and you can still use histoscopy without upgrading similarly now in an era where in breast cancer is increased and we are doing giving lot of tamoxifen which is an acrm over a longer period of time if you see acrms cause cystic atrophy and they resemble, resemble carcinoma they cause postmenopausal bleeding and if the endometrial thickness is more than 8 mm and the patient is symptomatic there is a role for histoscopy wherein you have to remove the entire cystic pathology and send it for histopathology and longer the use of tamoxifen more the chances that it can come out to be adenocarcinoma so in this patients again histoscopy plays an important role and the miniature histoscope will help you doing it in office only another silent disease which we have recognized more because of histoscopy especially pre ivf in patients with implantation failure with patients with dyspareunia is what is endometritis and these are pictures where you will see the strawberry appearance you have the cisnel criteria hyperemia of glands stromal edema which is pale and if you see micro polyps then it becomes conclusive and when you tell your pathologist you take a biopsy and ask him to look for plasma cells and if you find 3 to 4 plasma cells per hyperfluid it becomes then classical case where you if you treat with antibiotics and estrogen progesterone combination your implantation then improves and your fertility rate improves coming to uterine anomalies now with 3d sonography we are able to diagnose more of t shaped uteruses i shaped uteruses as per the ishray ag new classification and here you can see 
mini resectoscope 15 French without any dilatation. You can go in under vision. Once you confirm the septum, it then becomes very easy to just go and incise the septum remaining in the center in one plane. And this is a complete septum. And you can see we go in with the cautery. We are, should not be worried about people say that we should use only scissors. In such a thick septum, it is better to use the cautery. Don't worry about the thermal spread because bipolar and with miniature hysteroscope, rather the uh, mini hysteroscope, you will find that the spread is absolutely minimal. But as a prophylaxis, we do put in a, a pediatric foley inside for seven days, give antibiotics and always do a control hysteroscopy after the next period to see if there are any adhesions and then only go ahead for any ART. So mini resectoscope is a boon for all this because without dilatation you can go. Similarly, lateral metroplasty for all dysmorphic uterus, you will see that you can diagnose it. You can diagnose it completely by 3D sonography and then with again the 15 French bipolar, you can go and expand the cavity, cutting the myometrial fibers and you can see how dense or thick these fibers are. The scissors are not sometimes useful and you cut just short of the internal os and create a bigger volume. Again, we put a pediatric follies and you can see the os now from the isthmus. This should be the endpoint on this side. Similarly, endpoint on the other side, we'll be seeing the osha from the isthmus and creating a triangular cavity is our aim. We again also do a little bit of uh, resecting of the fundus so as to create a small dome shape. Now don't overcorrect. Put a foley's and again do control and you will see that the volume in the next hysteroscopy is increased considerably of seeing glands. And we have a series of six patients with such who are secondary infertility, multiple abortion, and all have taken pregnancy to term and delivered after this procedure. So using the bipolar current with mini resectoscope is a boon for this to enlarge the cavity. So this is not in We have also gone ahead and devised a reporting system wherein it should be proper for everyone to uh, have transparency in reporting for what indication, what media used, what are the findings and diagrammatically presented so that our fellow consultants can also see and do not repeat a procedure. We have published this in the Jogi as our 300,000 cases of office hysteroscopy, a C and treat. We have even published the office ambulatory hysteroscopy tissue retrieval system in Indian study. We also went over it with, with how we can open cervical stenosis tissue retrieval system in C2, previously described by scissors, bipolar needles, French needles, five French needles, or maybe even the grasper. But we went on to show, and this has been presented at the IG Trocar channel also. I will not go into the details of this, but under vision, we can, in an office setting, we can open a stenosis cervical canal as well as internal os and enter and finish off the pathology. That is circumferential cutting with controlled suction. We can easily enter the cavity without causing any pain to the patient and still finish off or the pathology and in office. So these three cases video we had presented, which was accepted in the ISG journal and the pain scores were two, four and six and the patient tolerated the procedure very well. But the golden rule still remains proper PS2 scoping diagnosis, evaluation and counseling, knowledge of equipment at your disposal, dispersion of knowledge amongst your team, and then comes the skilled surgeon. And on this basis, now we are off to our next venture, that is the School of Hysteroscopy, the first of its kind in India at the Symbiosis Women's Medical College. And we'll be having our first course on 4th, 5th, and 6th. Most important thing is structured teaching, hands-on, simulators, correlation with sonography. These have been the highlights. And this is what I have learned that the next generation should learn hysteroscopy in such a manner so that we have uniformity across India. And thank you for 
patient hearing. And I would like to thank Dr. Sneha, Dr. Mukta for having me here. Thank you very much, Dr. Melintala. Yeah. It was a very nice, uh, complete coverage of all the hysteroscopy techniques and advances that you can use. And uh, the videos were also very impressive. So yeah. especially how you showed that, how the malignancy you have taken out, uh, the cervical stenosis dealt with is fantastic. And the mini hysteroscope, how it has come, um, to help a lot is also, I think, a newer innovation. So yeah. it is fantastic. And office hysteroscopy, of course, the amount of procedures that are being done uh, is quite amazing. Yeah. So yeah. I thank you, Dr. Arun Barua. Would you like to say something? Yeah, I just like to appreciate because basically hysteroscopy has become a bread and butter for every endoscopist. And we need to have an uniform reporting system because the patients do not want to undergo the procedure again and again. So the format that Milin has actually shown us, I have also seen it earlier. I feel that this is one of the best formal reporting procedure that every endoscopic surgeon should endorse it. And probably we can also put it to the IAG because until unless we have an uniformity in reporting, I think we will not be able to take out any particular studies in at a large scale. Everything will remain consigned to an individual scale or to an institutional scale. We have so much of data in our country, so much of work is going on in our country, but to put it on an uniform platform, that is where we are lacking. Thank you so much, Melin. I'm always your fan. Thank you. I know Thank you've been you. doing amazing yeah. jobs. Nice to see you. Uh, no, this really, we feel proud that, and we always learn new things when we attend your presentations. Of yeah. course, that's what education is for. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us. The school. That yes. is the reason we are starting a school. And uh, we'll have our inauguration with Dr. Stefan Obetoke coming in on 6th. Even Dr. Firuza Parikh is coming to inaugurate the school. And we want to have uniformity in this procedure amongst all gynecologists. What we do, exactly. we should be up to international standards and levels. We already have, we are doing it. But then we should come on one platform. That is the purpose. You can count on me as a first student of two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so nice of you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Miller. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much for having me. Uh, welcome you. Although you came in late, we are happy that you've joined the forum, Atul. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just trying to get uh, on with all my backlog of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hectic week. Uh, RTS, congratulations, uh, Atul. Hi, Milin. Hi, Arun. Yeah, hi. Yes. Arte, Good evening, you. Uh, Dr. Congratulations. And hearty yeah. congratulations, Atul, sir, for taking over IIG. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you all. Thank you, Milin, sorry. sir. And thank you, respected chairpersons, for this wonderful Just And we trying are to get to welcome done with all my backlog of work. IIG ship, Dr. And Atul Ganatra, sir. I am not able board. to hear you all. I don't know why. But we are I hearing your we, voice. We can I, hear you. We I think your you. your device volume must be low. <laughs> yeah. The audio volume must be low. I think Atul has missed the greatest comment, greatest comment given by the Prakash. Maybe Chibari. I need to log in again. I'm not Being an endoscopist is also the busiest of OBGYN. Yeah, I think your uh, volume is slow. No, no. Now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Yeah. So we welcome Atul sir in thank this you, thank you very much. symposium. So yeah. Atul sir, yeah. we want to hear from you your plans regarding the upcoming year for IAG and for the academics in the field of endoscopy. Uh, I think I did present a part of it. The first conference is where Milind and Krishna Kumar are going to be the boss. That is going to be the his conference for her. We are doing a conference on hysteroscopic. I mean, I mean, uh, uterine anomalies, which is going to be intrauterine pathologies only, where we'll have <clears throat> case-based discussions on intrauterine pathologies, then the sonologists will diagnose it, the reality guys will tell us what, what wrong it can do, and then the hysteroscopy guys will operate upon it. So this is going to be a very niche conference, which is on 8th and 9th of June. So I'm sure a lot of you all would want to come there, and, and it's going to be a niche conference for intrauterine pathologies, focus one, one and a half hour sessions per pathology. And in the morning on the 8th, we will be doing a workshop on 
hystroscopy, ART and ultrasound. And I'm hopefully in a week's time, once I start breathing a little better, the brochures will be out and uh, <laughs> things will start working. <laughs> Atul, we are there to, with you to help you out. Don't worry. So, Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Thank you. We're counting on you and KK for arranging yeah, the entire definitely, hystroscopy. Definitely. Plan. definitely. Yeah. So, the only problem which has arisen from this is my 10th. My daughter has to report to the US on the 10th. Ah, uh, 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 Atul, she's gone into Chicago, I believe. No, she's got uh, MD Gynac in uh, Jackson Memorial in Miami. Oh, Miami. Wow. Oh. And uh, she has to report there on 10th of June. Oh. And my <laughs> conference is on 8th and 9th. So, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll manage that. The next, of course, will be Apaj. Yeah. To come in August. And I think Otul will have to hire a special flight doing everything, both personal and professional. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think it's this year is going to be full of surprises like this. I don't think I have a choice. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let Madhvi go, my wife go ahead of me, and then maybe I'll, I can join her after the conference. Her course starts on 1st of July. But anyway, congratulations, Dr. Sneha and Mukta. I think it was a wonderful sure. program. I, I saw the entire program, but unfortunately, uh, just finished work, and I thought, let me at least log in for the last five minutes if I can. Yes. But I, Milind, I, I heard your, your uh, presentation. Amazing. Thank and you. Uh, Thank wonderful work done. I think, a lot, like Arun said, that we all do, I mean, I do about 20 operative stores every month, but we don't have it on a common platform. And uh, that's how, that's how it should be. We should have a universal reporting for the entire country. And I'm sure our cases will become in, come in thousands. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, in fact, Milin and myself to... did yeah. a lovely case in the last workshop. And that you have to present, huh? Uh, RPOC with cool. Milin's. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that, yes. Yeah, in the AGL fantastic. this time, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for joining. In spite of your yeah, in spite of your busy schedule, uh, you could spare some time to you know join the program. And definitely, uh, we are very happy to have you. Yes, uh, Madam Rekha, we want to say something on on behalf of uh, IAG um, and uh, along with uh, Dr. Atul. I all, also want to remind everybody of the Apaj, which we are organizing. Yeah. Uh, Atul is part of the organizing team, so he's uh, helping us with the organizing, which is going to be end of August, 29th, 30th, 31st, and 1st of September. So that will be the next big event for you, I think, after hystroscopy, I think. Right, Atul? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Rekha. Yeah. And now, I think we are going to come there for one week. KK's daughter is getting married there itself. Oh. <laughs> I think we'll all have to come there for a week. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Time. Thank you so much. Yes, looking forward to the Apache conference. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any All the best, Dr. Sneha. Yes, any comments? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Milen, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And once again, now I just take this opportunity to thank all of you. Uh, uh, Atul sir, we missed you during the inauguration, but uh, definitely would like to thank you once again and uh, respected Dr. Prakash Trivedi sir and Dr. Krishna Kumar, um, uh, Dr. Pandit Paraskar, all of them were here to uh, for uh, grace the occasion uh, and of course to bless me and have the you best wishes. The ex expert um, esteemed faculties, in fact, Dr. Shailesh Puntambekar and Milin, who are my BJ alumni. Uh, we are very happy to have them here. And uh, of course, Dr. Smith Patel uh, and Dr. Deepak Limbacha, everybody was amazed to see the videos and their presentations also. So I thank all the chairpersons, Dr. Anita Singh, Dr. Sanjay Makwana, and of course, Dr. Arun Madhavarua, uh, Madam Rekha, and uh, everyone here. I thank Dr. Kalan Baramde, the convener, and Dr. Mukta. Uh, who has, you know, taken all the efforts to coordinate this uh, program. And thank you so much, uh, Sahiti, for uh, the flawless event. Thank you so much, everyone. And I just take this opportunity you. to seek your blessings <coughs> and best wishes for my candidature uh, as Foxy Vice President uh, for the upcoming elections. Thank and you so thank much. You. Wish you all the best, Neha. Huh? All and the best. Sure thank you. Come out successful. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sneha ma'am for your vote of thanks and all our best wishes are with you.
and with this together let us strive to create a brighter future where education becomes the catalyst for positive change and empowerment of the youth and with this positive thoughts i seek your blessings and your permission to close your web uh, this webinar yeah. at this thank juncture you. and thank you all so very much to join us for this webinar and we will continue to have more of academic sessions of this kind thank you so much